before I introduce our guests, however, uh, I would be remiss if I did not promote the book, Looking Back, Moving Forward, which is a very comprehensive 200-year history of the freedom struggle here in Southwest Georgia. It was written by uh, former uh, Albany State Professor Lee Farnwood, and he also is the former executive director here at the uh, Civil Rights Institute. Uh, the book is $17 if you buy it here uh, at the museum, or it's $19.95 if you order it. But we certainly uh, encourage you to read this book. I think it's something that you will enjoy, something that you can pass down. Uh, with that having been said, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Eric Leonard, who is the acting superintendent at the historic site in Anderson Hill. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him earlier this year. We struck up an instant friendship, but more importantly, we found that we had a kindred spirit as it relates to history. Um, it's a surprising sometimes to know how much you don't know. And that was the case when I began to talk with him and begin to look at what's going on and what has gone on and what's continuing to go on in Andersonville. But you didn't come to hear about him, you came to hear from him. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eric Bennett. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, this past Monday was the 98th birthday of the National Park Service, the agency that administers America's national parks. You know, we're two years away from our centennial, and that's that's been cause for the agency and for the employees, you know, the 20,000 or so employees that work for it. And for reflection, you know, also looking backward, thinking about moving forward, you know, into the you know the next century of America's national parks. There are today over 400 national park sites, and you know, when we think of national parks, we tend to, in the broad, think of the big natural places, the Yellowstones, the Grand Canyons, and they are significant. They were the first things that were saved. They are today a minority of the system. The, of those 400 national park sites, most of them are places like Andersonville, and you know, they reflect the incredible complexity of this nation. And just you know, here in the state of Georgia, we have you know, the Chattahoochee River going through Atlanta. That's a recreation area. You know, a so it's a mixture of resources. There's you know, on the coast Cumberland Island. You know that's a wilderness area. It's a it's Georgia's one sort of nat, you know, specifically natural park. And then you have places like Jimmy Carter National Historic Site, Andersonville, you know, Oak Mulgee National Monument, the Martin Luther King National Historic Site, you know, the Fort Pulaski, Kennesaw Mountain, and all of these places. They're set aside for one reason generally, but you know, that, that reason is sort of the entry point to a wide variety of discussions or, or, or things to think about. And, and certainly American society, you know, we, we often view history as you know, just a collection of dates, times, events, famous people, you know, much like you know, a quilt you hang on the wall where everything has a place. When, you know, in fact, history is you know, certainly much more complicated than that. You know, it's more like a Jackson Pollock painting in which paint is thrown onto the canvas and then sort of blends together. And Andersonville is very much you know, a place that's often just distilled down to one thing, one sort of category, and, that, and it's simplified to just another Civil War place. Now, what is a Civil War place? You know, when we use that term, you know, for over a century, you know, Civil War place has tended to mean a place in which leaders or battles are celebrated and the causes, context, and consequences are sanitized. You know, in the present day, we often romanticize you know, our past as you know, the good old days, this sort of nostalgic view of, of history where everything's simpler. You know, it's not. The, our, our past is, quite frankly, as complicated as our present. And, and certainly this past summer, you know, you know, 
we have seen our present you know, both in, in, just within this nation and then in the world is very complicated. Andersonville's complexity is likewise you know, you know, full of layers and very, very important to explore. We often just dismiss it as a Civil War place. And it starts as that, but it, it goes beyond that. The, our Civil War, you know, our history, at, you know, Andersonville was just a place in southwest Georgia. It was a train stop, you know, a, a, a depot on the train until you know, the Civil War you know, changed the face of this nation and certainly that little place in southwest Georgia. The Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 changes the face of the war in more ways than one, but most especially the enlistment of black soldiers. The war, you know, it's become a war about freedom and African American men are, you know, they have an opportunity to take, a, take an active role in the war and they pursue it. Around that same time, the United States government, the, the War Department, and a legal scholar develop a, a written code of war, a code of conduct for a civilized army. And this it's also known as General Orders 100 or the Lieber Code. And it's important for a number of reasons. It, as we've just recently marked the 150th anniversary of the very first Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions are based, inspired by this Lieber Code. Another way that I personally like to view the Lieber Code is it's the first equal rights policy of the United States of America. Boldly, the United States Army says black soldiers are to be treated equally. You know, regardless of race, you know, it, prisoners of war are to be treated equally. That's a pretty bold position and it had consequences. You know, the, in the summer, by the end of the summer of 1863, the exchange system between the two warring parties, the United States of America and the Confederacy, has, has broken down and it's broken down over one central question. You know, what to do with the black soldier? The United States has said you know, they are to be treated equally and the Confederacy has said the exact opposite. They are to be treated you know, according to relevant state law. You know, as essentially as slaves in insurrection, in rebellion. And, and what that means in the field is uh, you know, con the Confederacy is consistently inconsistent. You, you're dealing with individual state laws, and individual circumstances. But in, in the broad, as the armies continue to fight and prisoners continue to be taken, that has real dire consequences. It, the, the United States position, you know, remarkable position, that the black soldier is equal costs lives, thousands of lives, you know, in, in both captivity, temporary, you know, and then, you know, deaths, you know, prisoners of life, prisoners of war dying in these different places. In, at the beginning of the Civil War, you know, Southwest Georgia is, is part of the heart of the plantation agriculture area, you know, Sumter County you know, was a majority of you know, its majority population were enslaved African Americans and these people bear witness you know, to what happens at the prison. They are forced to build it. About 900 slaves are, are put to work felling trees, digging ditches, squaring logs to construct a, you know, a giant prison pen. They're forced to work in and around it. There are numerous references to enslaved men primarily working you know, at or near the prison complex. These, these slaves are bearing witness to what happens at the prison. You know, they're, they're watching it. One, a slave by the name of Tynes Kendricks, Years later, in the 1930s, when he's interviewed by the WPA, he, he uses you know, the phrase, you know, it's the worstest place I ever saw. And this is someone who was born and raised in Macon County, Georgia, as a slave. And you know, what he saw in that prison was worse than other things. Or at least, you know, when he was interviewed, that's how he felt. Slaves, of course, you know, 
aren't simply bearing witness, they're participating in this process, both unwillingly and then willingly. And it's the willing choice that's very fascinating. And, and we'll return to that in a minute. Within the prison itself, during its 14 months of operation, somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 100 black soldiers are held prisoner. These are primarily men of United States Colored Troops, or USCT regiments, and the 54th Massachusetts. They're all, almost all of them are captured at a battle in Florida, just straight south of us, in February of 1864, known as the, the Battle of Alusty. And you know, that's, that's the, today it's a Georgia State Park, or a Florida State Park, and it's the largest Civil War reenactment in, in this part of the Southeast. The, those African-American soldiers that on February 20th, 1864, fight a rear guard action where they delay the Confederacy while the rest of the United States Army forces you know, retreat. The Confederacy isn't you know, really sure what to do with them. The soldiers spend a little time in Pensacola before eventually by the late spring they're transferred up to Andersonville. Within the prison, they camp together, which is not at all unusual. You know, groups of soldiers from different, from same locations are camping as you know, camping together as the opportunity arises. The Confederate op you know, command at Andersonville, you know, how do they view these men? Are they soldiers? They put them to work as slaves. Every morning, the, the Negro squad was lined up. They, they did a roll call. They counted out, and then they walked out the prison do door. And they were put to hard labor around the prison, assisting it you know, in construction projects, burial detail, you know, you know, basic labor. They're getting something other prisoners aren't getting. You know, if you're a young man from Indiana or Iowa, you know, every morning you watch that those men line up and walk out. You don't get to do that, and they do that every single day. Frank Maddox, who's with the 35th USCT, we you know, is a is a rare voice for us. For the most part, we don't have a lot of first-hand accounts of the the few African American soldiers held in Andersonville. Frank Maddox testifies in the Wurtz trial at the end of the war, and his testimony provides us a great deal of insight to you know, that their particular part of this experience. And he remembers that the rebel sergeant in charge of the squad would never treat us boys as Captain Wirtz wanted him to treat us. He wanted him to be whipping us and knocking us about, and he did not do it. Captain Wirtz ordered him to do it. I've seen him many times when he gave the orders. I looked right at him when the words came out of his mouth. I never saw colored men put in the stocks or the chain gang. When they wanted to punish them, they put them across a log and whipped them half to death and put them back to work. For those young white soldiers from across the United States, Andersonville becomes a very paradoxical place. What you knew of, of slavery is what you read in Harriet Beecher Stowe before the war, and then you, you serve in the South in the campaigns. When you're brought to Andersonville, in a, in a real sense, you're seeing slavery almost firsthand in that if you attempt to escape, if you break prison rules, you're put in, you know, the punishments that are being levied out to prisoners at Andersonville are right out of the plantation society. Iron collars, balls and chains, prisoners are being whipped. If you run away, they send the dogs after you. There are several pens of dogs kept. There's a contractor who's literally being paid by the head for every person he captures and brings back to the prison. You know, for the enslaved African Americans around the prison, that, that, that's life. For the prisoners within Andersonville, this is a, they're experiencing something that they'd read about, but they'd certainly never seen firsthand. 
We, we speak a lot at Andersonville that you know what side of the wall you're on, you know, or, or and what the specific details to your captivity experience often really affect your perspective. One of our more famous parole prisoners, you know, someone who he signed an oath. He's he, he was working as a clerk in the hospital office, you know, testifying after, to Congress after the Civil War. He says very plainly that from his opinion, the, the, the black soldiers held at Andersonville are treated better than, than most prisoners because they got to get out every day. You know, this young man, of course, you know, he slept, he had a tent and a bed. He he didn't he wasn't in the stockade anymore. So he, you know, he's one to talk a little bit. When prisoner George Tibbles attempts an escape in the the fall of 1864, you know, it'll be 150 years next week. They make it. He and his friends, one of his brothers, make it 40 miles before they're caught by the dogs and brought back to the prison. George Tibbles was you know, you know, told by Captain Wirtz he was to be put in the stocks to be punished, or, or in the ball. And, he was going to be fitted with a ball and chain, and so he was taken to the blacksmith. The blacksmith for the the prison, the military prison, is is an enslaved man who is property of the Confederate Army. Before the ball and chain is fully fitted, the, all the officers leave the room, going off to, a, to another meeting, and in the quiet of that moment, this young, young man and the, the enslaved blacksmith have a short conversation, and when George Tibbles tells it after the war, what we don't have is the name of the blacksmith, which I regret. The, and, and the blacksmith speaks about the experience of being property of the Confederate Army. And when nobody's looking, and the, as the two talk, the blacksmith slips this young prisoner a knife that he's filed out of a scrap piece of metal. And the, you know, the privileges of even a prisoner in trouble, you know, what young George Tibbles does is slip the knife in his coat they're then, if, if they're be, they were put on a train, he and his friends, and bound for another prison. And on the train, they, they conspire to, you know, they're not going to the, another prison, so uh, across the state of Georgia, they, they jump the train out as they're being moved to, you know, to South Carolina. And remembering later, you know, he recalls, the knife given to me by the old blacksmith in Andersonville was the greatest service in assisting us in our travels. During this tedious journey, you know, slaves along the route were always our friends and whenever they were satisfied we were Yankee prisoners, they often risked our lives to aid us and often shared uh, with us their scanty food. George Tibbles also testifies to Congress and you know, at the end of his testimony he, he returns to the, the the blacksmith who slips him in the knife and says, without that knife, I, we wouldn't have escaped. And you know, when you read his testimony to Congress, George Tibbles, is, you know, he's a bit of an action hero. He, he, they took incredible risks trying to escape. But in that quiet moment in the blacksmith shop, 150 years from now, in just a couple of, couple of weeks, you know, who's the braver person? Who's taking the bigger risk? That was a choice that that, that man made, and, and again, I, I regret that we don't know his name. Escape narratives of, of soldiers you know, held at Andersonville and other prisons throughout the South are full of these kinds of stories. You know, you know, they depend on the kindness of, of slaves for their, for their freedom, for their safety. You know, and, and so, in a very real sense, in 1864 and early 1865 throughout the South, you know, in Georgia, but especially in North and South Carolina and the prisons there, the Underground Railroad as an idea is flipped. The, the people seeking freedom are United States soldiers, the people aiding them, taking incredible risks to aid them are white Southern Unionists and they, they're taking risks too because 
you know, dissent in the Confederacy is being handled very harshly. But you know, slaves are taking incredible risks to aid prisoners. We, I just in the last couple of of weeks, you know, found a new escape narrative I hadn't seen before of a, a New York soldier who, in November, jumps a train bound for the Camp Lawton prison, one of Andersonville's sisters across the state of Georgia, and over the course of about four weeks makes his way to Atlanta. He gets to Atlanta, but, you know, and Sherman, the United States Army has left. Sherman is gone. And instead of continuing to wander through Georgia, he makes you know, a calculated risk. And he goes back to a place of safety, one of the plantations where he'd hidden along his journey. And for almost five months, Thomas Howe hides behind a bed bedstead in a slave cabin in a plantation outside of Forsyth, Georgia. And his, his escape narrative gives us names, you know, so it's a rare one because he's, he was with those people. They were, they were family to him. And it, it's not until the U.S. Army sweeps into Georgia you know, in April of 1865 as the war ends that he you know, finally makes it fully to safety. With the end of the war, you know, com comes the beginning of a great period of readjustment, and, and, and Andersonville remains a part of this. Late in the summer of 1865, the U.S. Army sends an expedition to Andersonville to transform the burying ground for prisoners into a national cemetery. And imagine, you know, that's a time of great chaos in Georgia and throughout the South. The, the U.S. Army is literally, by early summer, keeping a guard at Andersonville so the white locals will not destroy everything, will not destroy the graves, will not destroy the site. And who, who is this guard? They are members of the 137th USCT, you know, established out of Alabama and then Macon primarily, and among their number accompanying this expedition is Daniel Sanders. He'd spent nearly all of his 44 years enslaved when the U.S. Army liberates Selma in April, at the beginning of April in 1865. He votes with his feet. You know, for less than a week after his liberation, he joins the U.S. Army as a soldier. Four months later, he finds himself in southwest Georgia at Andersonville, and he's witness to the establishment of the National Cemetery, the formal identification of the graves. While that expedition is there, he, he gets ill he, and dies. And you know, for Daniel Sanders, you know, his freedom came at a, at a great cost. You know, he, he dies just a couple of days before Clara Barton, also accompanying this expedition, raises the American flag over the National Cemetery for the first time. And Clara Barton is a very famous figure in American history. Her, what she did at Andersonville is often you know, misunderstood. You know, she accompanied the expedition. She did not identify graves. She didn't create the National Cemetery. The Army did. And, and it's worth noting, you know, sometimes unintended consequences are the most important ones. She went there to help to to make a list of the men who were buried there to help find fa give families answers. During the three weeks they're camped in Southwest Georgia at Andersonville, the entire expedition of about 40 people. I mean, she's the only woman there. And so as, as someone a native of the Pacific Northwest, it's the Lewis and Clark moment in that you know, Lewis and Clark 200 years ago had one woman with them and that one woman saved their lives with American Indians. Claire Barton plays a similar role. You know, freed men and women flock to Andersonville to this army expedition to seek Miss Clara. And, and to ask her questions about you know, what does freedom mean? 
and in one case, in her diary is full of these questions and how she, how surprised she is. You know, she literally says in her diary, "I don't know why they're asking me this." One of the one of the questions she's asked is, "My master tells me that President Lincoln is dead, and because President Lincoln is dead, I'm not free." Is this true? In three short weeks, Clara Barton becomes a prophet of emancipation, you know, helping to make sense of the war, to, to give you know, early definitions to what it means to be free in Southwest Georgia at the end of that war. And, and that you know, we certainly view that as the most important thing she did at Andersonville. It's the thing she wasn't there to do. You know, in January 1866, at the old Confederate hospital at the prison site, the American Missionary Association establishes a Freedmen's School. And that Freedmen's School operates in that old Confederate hospital building for about eight years. The Freedmen's School operates at Andersonville into the 1930s and 40s. And you have, you know, young women from the from New England coming down to teach, again, teach freedmen, you know, how to read and write, how to become American citizens. It's an empowering moment. And it's a reminder too that you know, these places aren't islands. There are other people watching. In 1869, on January 1st, the Freedmen School holds what we consider to be the very first commemorative service of any formal sense at Andersonville. They hold an several hour long Emancipation Day service that starts at the Freedmen's School, walks past the prison site. They place wreaths in the National Cemetery, not at graves because they don't have 13,000 wreaths, but at, at markers you know, that had stanzas of a poem known as the Bivouac of, a, of the Dead. And they circle around the flagpole in the National Cemetery and sing, My Country, Tis of Thee. They then retire into Andersonville itself and hold another service. We know of this, uh, we have a very detailed description of this service because a minister there from Massachusetts only a couple of weeks later is, is given you know, less than 48 hours to, to clear Sumter County or the Ku Klux Klan will kill him because he's dared report to the military occupation authority, the U.S. Army in Atlanta, that freedmen are being burned out of their homes at Andersonville by one of the landowners of the prison site. You know, that land had, had been seized and not returned to the private owners. And while Reverend Pearson is forced back to Massachusetts and makes, makes a report to his senator, we also know, you know, a friend of mine researching you know, Andersonville and our monuments found, found something in the National Archives this summer I'd never seen. And it's a copy of a general order from the Military Occupation Authority in Atlanta banning Benjamin Dykes from the prison grounds, protecting the Freedmen's School, the Freedmen living on the property. And, you know, and, and that's, it's a remarkable you know, testament to the complexity of that particular moment. By 1870, you know, Memorial Day becomes a, a formal tradition at Andersonville and Memorial Day at Andersonville into the 20th century is almost exclusively an African-American observance. And in 1870, the Republican governor of Georgia is present. You know, most of our accounts of these early Memorial Days come from the Southern Democratic and white newspapers and so they are they are full of language that's not particularly pleasant and they are often very disparaging of these celebrations. And there is resistance. By 1890 the US Army starts to move African Americans out of the cemetery for Memorial Day and so instead what happens? They use the town of Andersonville, and in, in the early 1890s, Memorial Day involves in the vicinity of 20,000 people celebrating their freedom, celebrating the lives that were lost to gain that freedom. 
this purge of African Americans at Andersonville accelerates in the early 20th century and it has a lot to do with the you know, what's known as reconciliation in which the you know, it's a it's a thesis in which the North and the South reunite, you know, the white North and the white South reunite into Jim Crow laws and there's a lot there's some truth to that and the greatest embodiment of this process at Andersonville is not at the National Park site itself but in the town of Andersonville where there's a monument to the man who oversaw the death of 13,000 American soldiers. That monument was placed by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1909 and they were so concerned about that monument that Memorial Day that year, one month after the monument was dedicated, the local militia was called out to make sure that the Memorial Day celebration didn't damage or infringe this new monument. And, and that monument was a watershed. By 1910, you know, you, you've had a two-year process in which train rates to Andersonville for Memorial Day are doubled and then those trains are canceled outright. In 1910, the local community in Americas you know, is pleased to assure its audience that Memorial Day will be a somber, appropriate affair overseen by the Grand Army of the Republic Post. Those are, that's a veterans organization out of Fitzgerald. And, that, you know, and they make allusions to the trouble we've had, it's over. There's a lot more research that needs to be done about this period. One of the things that we know now is Memorial Day in the 1930s, there are, you know, there's references to colored women's groups you know, participating in the ceremony. So like any good thesis, there's always exceptions to that rule, but there's a lot more that, that needs to be understood. What we do know is the that from the 1920s into the 1930s, this very quiet period at Andersonville. The Civil War generation is gone. We bury our last Civil War veteran, a former prisoner, in 1915 in the National Cemetery. <coughs> the Army, you know, people, fewer people are coming to Andersonville at that time. But of course, you know, these things, you know, things always change and in, in the late 1930s the army begins a process to modernize the National Cemetery and, and maybe it's because they knew World War II was coming, maybe it's a happy coincidence. In 1942, mothers of African American soldiers fighting overseas, right? You know, go to Andersonville and speak to the army superintendent at the National Cemetery and they all have the same question. If my son dies, will he be allowed to be buried here? And that's a really important question. The, the black soldiers held you know, nearly a century before at, at Andersonville, when they died, they're buried alongside their white compatriots, largely because it's prisoners doing the burying, and there's, when a hundred men are dying a day, you don't have time to do, to do something separate. And so in a sense, Andersonville had begun its life as the first integrated national cemetery in America. But you know, these places, you know, American places reflect America. And in 1942, that army superintendent writes his superiors in Washington, D.C. with the question, what do I do? And, and he set up, a, you know, he has a proposal and beginning it, with the end of the war, you know, for about 15 years, there is a segregated section within the National Cemetery. Today, that's known as Section G, and not coincidentally, it's the smallest of the burial sections. And it, it's right across the road from where the white veterans of, of the war, you know, the killed in action burials are, you know, so they're right next to each other. In a happy coincidence, the the location of Section G is where the Memorial Day services for a half century had been held, literally on that ground. And today, you have to, st you have to know what to look for, and you have to stand and kind of look at the ground, but there's a, there's a circular rise where those black soldiers are buried, where there once was a little rotunda that you know, our Memorial Day services occurred at. Very quietly, about 1960, the Army 
integrates the cemetery. And, and that's a remarkable thing because we know, you know, I know of at least one other national cemetery in the South at that same time that closed instead of allowing you know, black veterans to be buried. You know, the Army made a you know, very brave choice. And, you know, and again, America evolves. The, in, you know, we're right real close now to the 51st anniversary of the March on Washington and 51 years ago the was a time of, of great you know, unrest in, in southwest Georgia and other places in the south and America isn't any different. In August of 1963 a, a Korea War veteran, a 33 year old by the name of James Lee Brown is shot in the back by an America's you know, police officer. Again, accounts vary. The, in the newspapers of the time, the, the sheriff of Sumter County is very clear to say he's shot in, behind the left ear, not in the back. But the end result is the same. And just a couple of days before the March on Washington in August of, 18, of 1963, you have a family gathering in the integrated national cemetery, you know, and there's no speeches, no no great speeches, no television, but it's a family mourning, you know, and it's you know, you know, it's a harbinger of other things to come. Only three years later, the United States is embroiled in Vietnam, and. In May of 1966, a 19-year-old man, a, a paratrooper by the name of Jimmy Laverne Williams, is killed in, in Vietnam. His family in Wetumpka, Alabama, are very noted for pushing for school desegregation. And it's highly likely that in the death of their son, they're punished for it. There were two cemeteries in Wetumpka, Alabama in 1966. One of them is privately owned, therefore segregated. The other, the other is the city cemetery and the, the city of Wetumpka tells Mrs. Williams, his mother, that they are full. They don't have a place for him. They could put him in an unmarked grave. There's no room. His mother you know, fights for a couple of days, and this begins to make national news, because it's a, it's a soldier who's essentially being disrespected. She's reported as saying, when she, when she settles on the nearest safe place that will take him, and that place is Andersonville, and she's reported as saying this, my son died fighting on the front for all of us. He didn't die a segregated death, and he'll not be buried in a segregated cemetery. He's buried in Andersonville National Cemetery on Memorial Day on May 30th, 1966. And that, that burial you know, is an important moment and we have, we have you know, it's reported wi widely across the country. There are very interesting news you know, reports about it and, and certainly there's, a, there's newsreel footage that literally connects the dots and says it's an irony of history that this Confederate burying ground is a safe place for a soldier whose hometown said they had no room. Jimmy Williams is a really important grave to me personally. The, uh, a, a researcher you know, who's, who's now teaching at a university in New York and public, whose book was just published la this past month, about three years ago, you know, to shared that story with me. He's been in the cemetery you know, also you know, almost half a century and, and prior to three years ago we didn't talk about him. And certainly in the past in our exhibits and other things we, we didn't talk about the black soldiers. Men like James Henry Gooding of the 54th Massachusetts who dies at Andersonville in the summer of 1864. He's, he's one of the most famous African-American soldiers of the Civil War because until his capture he's writing letters home to New Bedford, Massachusetts that are being published in the newspaper. 
He's a former slave from North Carolina whose father bought him out of slavery, moved him to New York City where he's educated at a Quaker school. And when you read James Henry Gooding's letters, it shows. He's an incredibly articulate person who in the summer of 1863 writes Abraham Lincoln and says, you, your government has, has said that if I'm, to be, if I'm captured, I'm to be treated equally. Why aren't you paying me equally? And it's these stories and many others like them that are, you know, are an important part of what we do at Andersonville. You know, they're not always the stories that you necessarily know when you come to the site, but my staff, you know, we're, you know, these, these stories are very important to us. And, and telling Andersonville's history in a way that is more inclusive that more pe people can find meaning in is, is, is probably the, the most important thing we can accomplish at Andersonville. And so we, we welcome your questions, we welcome your visits, and you know, thank you very much for listening this evening. Okay, I have two questions. Did okay. I understand you to say watershed or watermark? Either, either term will work. The, that, one of the phrases, and, and one of my staff spoke here about a year ago, and he, he used to say, there's a phrase in the, the American Missionary Association that operated that Freedman School. They, have a, they had a magazine that reported the good work they were doing, and that magazine in 1870 has, includes a report from Andersonville, and they used the phrase, high watermark of slavery to define Andersonville. And that's a very provocative phrase. It's not certainly one that, that's familiar in how we think about Andersonville. We think of it as just this simple you know, place where something horrible happened. And, and their whole point is that it was essentially a reflection of the society that created and ran it. If that answers the question. Uh, the other question is the section, section G. Mm -hmm. uh, that segre segregated portion of the cemetery, the smallest section, African American, mm -hmm. yeah. eventually integrated, and why? Well, it's not that it's integrated. It's they they cease the practice of segregation, and you know, Chris Barr on my staff, who spoke here last year, he went and. He was a high school history teacher for seven years, and, and he's, he's a native of Southwest Georgia, loves the history here, and loves connecting the civil rights movement to you know, things we don't often think of. And his provocative thought about Section G is this, you know, we like to think that segregation is a part of our past. And it is, but it, in, in Andersonville National Cemetery, you know, we're never gonna integrate those graves. We're not gonna move them. And so those graves remain in a group, segregated. And among those graves is a, a soldier whose first name I forget, whose last name I believe is Fluker. He joins the US Army in, eight, in World War II and serves in a segregated army. He stays in and witnesses that army in 1948 desegregate. He's sent to Korea where he dies in, in the line of service. That same army then sends him back to Georgia to be buried, where they bury him in a segregated section within the cemetery. And, it, and it's, again, you know, change comes, but sometimes it's incremental. That, you know, what we know at this point about that process, and, and you know, Armies, the Army's management records of the National Cemetery leave a lot to be desired. There's, at this point, or, and certainly a lot of research that needs to be done. We, we don't, you know, our sense is somewhere right about 1960, they, they, they stop burying in Section G, they create a new section right behind it, known as Section, Section P. You know, we, we love our alphabet, of course, and, and that's, it's in Section P, just a couple of rows in, where James Brown is, was buried in 1963. Aaron, would you talk uh, with the audience a moment about the, the reverence that folk gave to the, how men would take off their hats and oh. the reverence given to, to the fallen heroes there at Andersonville? I thought that was a touch. <coughs> 
beginning in the early 1880s, you start to have a series of you know, you know, soldiers who'd been young men in 1864, who are now about my age, start traveling back to the places of that war and they make the pilgrimage to Andersonville and what they begin to notice is something that's very important. You know, by that time the prison is largely gone. You know, the walls have all fallen, they've been removed and reused, and there's sharecropping occurring on the prison site. And, when, you know, and there's a, a natural spring at the prison site known as Providence Spring and, and this is especially this practice is especially rooted at Providence Spring. In the, by 1885, you, whenever, whenever African American men, you know, sharecropping would, would stop at the spring and fill their cups, they'd take off their hats out of respect. The, in 1877, a woman, you know, by the, a, a New England writer by the name of Constance Fenimore Cooper, she's a, a niece of James Fenimore, Cooper, you know, he, you know, the writer of Last of the Mohicans, she, she's known in literary circles and there's actually an or, a society of you know, mostly you know, older white English professors who study her. She's she was known in the post-Civil War period to specialize in writing about the South. And she, she publishes a, a short story known as Rodman the Keeper in the Atlantic Monthly in 1877 and this the protagonist is is the cemetery caretaker who's new to the job and it's about the middle point of the short story there's a sequence in which it's Memorial Day and this massive procession of African Americans come into the cemetery and they say sir you weren't here last year but it's your job to lead us to, to where we will celebrate Memorial Day and remember these men and you know, she's writing that for a reason because you know, art imitates life and, and, and that's a, a real, you know, it's one of the sort of emotional points of, of the story in, in that it represents how different audiences are, are remembering this particular place. So you know, I think that gets, gets at it. Other questions? Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Eric, uh, the all black unit that was captured in Florida mm -hmm. and brought to Andersonville and served as slaves once they was placed at Andersonville. What happened to them after the Civil War ended? We that's another place where we don't know enough yet, where there's, you know, I think, grounds for a lot more research. You know, in the case of Frank Maddox, you know, we, we know, you know, he testifies in the, you know, what's a very famous you know, legal, mo legal history moment in American history, that war crimes trial of, of the prison commandant. After that, we don't particularly know and so you know, that's that's something that's on the list that needs to be researched and so if anyone's looking to do you know specialize in post-civil war history in a you know on a graduate level those are those are things that you know, someone needs to write about Questions. Let me join me in well thanking Eric for <laughs> I encourage you to go to Andersonville. The the tours are, are free. They do ask for donations. But as I as I said to Eric, you know, a lot that you think you know, you don't know. And I think it would be a great education. Let me just thank the uh, folk from the Boys and Girls Clubs for bringing these young people. Let me encourage you to make that uh, uh, one of the things on your to-do list for these young folk. That's a history that they need to know. Thank you for bringing them here tonight also. And thank you young people for being open to coming to hear some history that you won't normally hear. 
uh, let me repeat something that I started because we've had no people. The Civil Rights Institute is pushing this book, uh, looking back, moving forward. It is by Dr. Lee Farnwalt. It is a fundraiser for us, but it captures a 200-year history of the freedom struggle here in Southwest Georgia. We encourage you to buy the book. We encourage you to read the book thoroughly because this is some history that you will not find in any history book. It will not be taught in any classroom, but we have captured it here in this book and we encourage that you do so. I think we had one more question from Mr. Tanya. I didn't like to make a statement of this permission. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of all of us here, thank uh, the interim superintendent, Eric, for coming and speaking to us tonight. Oh, you're very welcome. Young people, that was a great history lesson within about 40 minutes. You heard some things you've never heard before, but you can piggyback on that by researching it and get more information. Mm -hmm. uh, a group of us from the Institute visited Andersonville about a year ago, mm -hmm. and Eric was one of our guys. Yeah. We spent about four hours there, and he took us all over the place and gave us a lot of information. And if you go there for a tour, you'll have inform information that you'll remember for a long, long time. And it brings back a lot of memories, and it will also encourage young people to work harder in school, to do a good job, and to set goals and try to be a first-class citizen wherever you go and whatever you do. And we thank you for what you all are doing at Andersonville, and we thank you for partner partnering with us here at the Institute. Oh, thank my you. pleasure. Some of your chairs, and if you didn't find one of the chairs in which you're seated, um, I'm going to make a couple of announcements. On September 17th at 2 p.m. across the street at the Shallow Missionary Baptist Church, there will be a historic marker unveiling. The Georgia Historical Society is creating a civil rights trail throughout the state of Georgia. Uh, we are fortunate that Albany is the first in that trail that's going to have a historic marker unveiled, and that will be at 2 p.m. Uh, across the street. If you look over there now, the mark is up, it's just covered. Um, the other thing is, on September 19th, from 5 to 7 here, uh, Lee Formwalt, the author of this book, will be here doing a book signing. He will do a book signing here from uh, 5 to 7. That following Saturday, he will be at the Visitors Bureau uh, down at Turtle Park from 10 uh, so 12, and then he will be do, doing another book signing that Sunday, uh, immediately after the services uh, over at Shallow. Uh, again, we encourage you to support this effort. We thank you for coming out. We encourage you on every, every fourth Thursday night to come out for our community nights. And remember, every second Saturday from 1 to 3, the Freedom Singers sing absolutely free and open to the public next door at the Old Mount Zion Church. Again, Eric, we thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you. And we <coughs>